The Law of Success, Lesson 9, Habit of Doing More Than Paid For You can do it if you believe you can. It may seem to be a departure from the subject of this lesson to start the lesson with the discussion of love, but if you will reserve your opinion until you have completed the lesson, you may be ready to agree that the subject of love could not have been omitted without impairing the value of the lesson. The word love is here used in an all-embracing sense. There are many objects, motives, and people which arouse one's love nature. There is some work which we do not like, some that we do like moderately, and under certain conditions there may be work that we actually love. Great artists, for example, generally love their work. The day laborer, on the other hand, usually not only dislikes his work, but may actually hate it. Work which one does merely for the sake of earning a living is seldom liked. More often it is disliked or even hated. When engaged in work which he loves, a man may labor for an unbelievably long period of hours without becoming fatigued. Work that a man dislikes or hates brings on fatigue very quickly. A man's endurance, therefore, depends very largely on the extent to which he likes, dislikes, or loves that which he is doing. We are here laying the foundation, as you will of course observe, for the statement of one of the most important laws of this philosophy, viz. A man is most efficient and will more quickly and easily succeed when engaged in work that he loves, or work that he performs in behalf of some person whom he loves. Whenever the element of love enters into any task that one performs, the quality of the work becomes immediately improved and the quantity increased without a corresponding increase in the fatigue caused by the work. Some years ago, a group of socialists, or perhaps they called themselves cooperators, organized a colony in Louisiana, purchased several hundred acres of farmland, and started to work out an ideal which they believed would give them greater happiness in life and fewer of the worries through a system that provided each person with work at the sort of labor he liked best. Their idea was to pay no wages to anyone. Each person did the work he liked best, or that for which he might be best equipped, and the products of their combined labors became the property of all. They had their own dairy, their own brick-making plant, their own cattle, poultry, etc. They had their own schools and a printing plant through which they published a paper. A Swedish gentleman from Minnesota joined the colony, and at his own request he was placed at work in the printing plant. Very soon he complained that he did not like the work, so he was changed and put to work on the farm, operating a tractor. Two days of this was all he could stand, so he again applied for a transfer and was assigned to the dairy. He could not get along with the cows, so he was once more changed to the laundry, where he lasted but one day. One by one he tried every job on the works, but liked none of them. It had begun to look as if he did not fit in with the cooperative idea of living, and he was about to withdraw when someone happened to think of one job he had not yet tried, in the brick plant. So he was given a wheelbarrow and put to work wheeling bricks from the kilns and stacking them in piles in the brickyard. A week's time went by and no complaint was registered by him. When asked if he liked his job, he replied, This bun juiced the job I like. Imagine anyone preferring a job wheeling bricks. However, that job suited the Swede's nature. He worked alone at a task which called for no thought and placed upon him no responsibility, which was just what he wanted. He remained at the job until all the bricks had been wheeled out and stacked, then withdrew from the colony because there was no more brickwork to be done. The nice, quiet job been finished, so I yank I ban go back to Minnesotai. And back to Minnesotai he went. When a man is engaged in work that he loves, it is no hardship for him to do more work and better work than that for which he is paid. And for this very reason, every man owes it to himself to do his best to find the sort of work he likes best. I have a perfect right to offer this advice to the students of this philosophy, for the reason that I have followed it myself, without reason to regret having done so. This seems to be an appropriate place to inject a little personal history concerning both the author and the law of success philosophy, the purpose of which is to show that labor performed in a spirit of love for the sake of the labor itself has never been and never will be lost. This entire lesson is devoted to the offering of evidence that it really pays to render more service and better service than one is paid to render. 
What an empty and useless effort this would be if the author had not himself practiced this rule long enough to be able to say just how it works out. For over a quarter of a century I have been engaged in the labor of love out of which this philosophy has been developed, and I am perfectly sincere when I repeat that which I have stated elsewhere in this course, that I have been amply paid for my labors by the pleasure I have had as I went along, even if I received nothing more. My labors on this philosophy made it necessary many years ago for me to choose between immediate monetary returns, which I might have enjoyed by directing my efforts along purely commercial lines, and remuneration that comes in later years, and which is represented by both the usual financial standards and other forms of pay which can be measured only in terms of accumulated knowledge that enables one to enjoy the world about him more keenly. The man who engages in work that he loves best does not always have the support in his choice of his closest friends and relatives. Combating negative suggestions from friends and relatives has required an alarming proportion of my energies. During the years that I have been engaged in research work for the purpose of gathering, organizing, classifying, and testing the material which has gone into this course, these personal references are made solely for the purpose of showing the students of this philosophy that seldom, if ever, can one hope to engage in the work one loves best without meeting with obstacles of some nature. Generally, the chief obstacles in the way of one engaging in the sort of work one loves best is that it may not be the work which brings the greatest remuneration at the start. To offset this disadvantage, however, the one who engages in the sort of work he loves is generally rewarded with two very decided benefits. Namely, first, he usually finds in such work the greatest of all rewards, happiness, which is priceless. And secondly, his actual reward in money, when averaged over a lifetime of effort, is generally much greater, for the reason that labor which is performed in a spirit of love is usually greater in quantity and finer in quality than that which is performed solely for money. The most embarrassing, and I might without any intention of disrespect say, the most disastrous opposition to my choice of a life work, came from my wife. This perhaps will explain why I have made frequent references in many of the lessons of this course to the fact that a man's wife may either make or break him, according to the extent to which she gives or withholds cooperation and encouragement in connection with his chosen work. My wife's idea was that I should accept a salaried position that would ensure a regular monthly income. Because I had shown, by the few salaried positions I had held, that I had marketable ability which should command an income of from $6,000 to $10,000 a year without any very great effort on my part. In a way, I saw my wife's viewpoint and was in sympathy with it. Because we had young growing children coming on who needed clothes and education and a regular salary, even though it were not large, seemed to be a necessity. Despite this logical argument, however, I chose to override my wife's counsel. Came then to her rescue the combined forces of her family and mine, and collectively they charged me head-on with what amounted to a command to write about face and settle down on a salary basis. Studying other people might be all right for a man who had the time to spend in this unprofitable manner, they reasoned, but for a young married man with a growing family this seemed hardly the thing to do. But I remained adamant. I had made my choice and I was determined to stand by it. The opposition did not yield to my viewpoint, but gradually, of course, it melted away. Meanwhile, the knowledge that my choice had worked at least a temporary hardship on my family, combined with the thought that my dearest friends and relatives were not in harmony with me, greatly increased my labors. Fortunately, not all of my friends believed my choice unwise. There were a few friends who not only believed I was following a course that would ultimately bring me out somewhere near the top of the mountain of useful achievement, but in addition to believing in my plans, they actually went out of their way to encourage me not to be whipped by either adversity or the opposition of relatives. Of this small group of faithful ones who gave me encouragement at a time when it was badly needed, perhaps one man should have the fullest credit, and this man is Edwin C. Barnes, a business associate of Thomas A. Edison. Mr. Barnes became interested in my chosen work nearly twenty years ago, and I owe it to him to state here that had it not been for his unwavering faith in the soundness of the law of success philosophy, I would have yielded to the persuasion of my friends and sought the way of least resistance via the salary route. This would have saved me much grief and an almost endless amount of criticism, but it would have wrecked the hopes of a lifetime, 
and in the end I would in all probability have lost also the finest and most desirable of all things, happiness, for I have been extremely happy in my work, even during the periods when the remuneration it brought me could be measured by nothing but a mountain of debts which I could not for the moment pay. 